So when Vince uh, invited me to come and present my research, I was first really excited, not just because I knew I wouldn't have to pay the registration fee, <laughs> but, which I did last year, um, but also because I thought it would be really cool and kind of postmodern to present on Buddhist geeks, at Buddhist geeks. Okay. But then when I realised that I wouldn't be able to read my paper line by line, which is the format that I'm used to as an academic, I really had a kind of oh shit moment. (laughs) So I want to start by inviting you, let's see, Um, sorry, I I might need to help with the, let's see, okay, I want to start by inviting you um, to my, the chapter is actually in publication process right now. But if you would like a copy, please free, feel free to email me at this address and I'll be happy to send you a copy. And I'd also really appreciate any dialogue or feedback because I'm actually writing a second piece on Buddhist Geeks right now. So it would be really super to hear your thoughts. And also I want to assure you that if you get lost in the details or if I just get really incoherent and nervous, that it all makes really perfect sense in the chapter. <laughs> okay. I promise. Okay. So those of you lucky enough to have been at the Buddhist Geeks Conference last year might recall Stephen Batchelor's eloquent closing talk. In thinking about the different ways to practice Buddhism, Stephen differentiated between being an artist and an art curator. Does anyone remember? Yeah. Okay. So the artist is a creator of something new, exciting and unique, and the art curator as the organizer and recorder of that creation. So I'd like to borrow, Nick, this metaphor from Stephen. And I want you to think, I'd like to invite you to think of yourselves, my, the, my fellow presenters, and all of those who participate in the Buddhist Geeks project as essentially artists, as artists who are creating a new vision of the Buddha and Buddhism for the 21st century. Let's see. All right, the geek Buddha, the Buddha of geeks. And I want you to think of me as your art curator. And as your art curator, I want to do two things. First, I want to give you a sense of the unique, defining features of your vision of the Buddha. And I'll do this through a short analysis of the interactions between Buddhism and technology and the effects that's producing on Buddhist geeks. And second... Oh, sorry. I want to give you a sense of how this new vision of the Buddha fits in with the Buddhas that have gone before him or her. In other words, what is the historical and cultural significance of Buddhist geeks? And why is it so interesting for a Buddhist studies scholar? Okay, let's see. Okay. So basically, in terms of my research methodology, I've basically spent about two, maybe two and a half months going through the website, and I think I listened to over 200 podcasts. Tough job, right? (laughs) I also analyzed the contents of the conferences, and I was here last year, I met many of you. And what I discovered amongst this very rich and uh, varied data was there were some very definite, clear patterns and themes. Now, the first three I've categorized here. I'm going to just talk briefly about each one. Okay, so Buddhism as technology. So what this does essentially is say there is a fundamental compatibility or identity between Buddhism and technology. It says that although Buddhism and technology may appear very different, In fact, they are kind of mirror images of each other. So you probably know that many people, Buddhist geeks, talk about Buddhism as an inner technology, an inner technology that kind of anticipates and reflects the new outer technologies. Now, this way of speaking about Buddhism, of reinterpreting it in a technological lens, is not unique to Buddhist geeks. In fact, since the 19th century, thinkers have been presenting the Buddha as a proto-scientist, 
and Buddhism as a religion for the modern age, as a religion compatible with science. So Buddhist geeks both continues this lineage. So we hear lots of talk of Buddhism as a science and a science of enlightenment. It also updates this lineage. It gives the scientific Buddha a kind of sexy makeover. <laughs> right. And these are some examples of this sexy makeover. Um, so, for example, not only is the Buddha a proto-scientist, he's also envisioned as the first management consultant. Does anyone know? Who's, can anyone recall from last year who presented the Buddha like this? No? Rowan, yeah, Rowan. Rowan Gunatilak, who's um, a, a core member of the Buddhist Geeks term. So what does this do? What is the purpose of framing Buddhism in this technological way? Essentially, it serves two purposes. One is it functions as a pragmatic pedagogy. It's a way to um, convey and teach the teachings of the Buddha in a language that will really resonate with a 21st century audience. The second thing it does is it establishes Buddhism and technology as legitimate conversation partners. Sorry, it says both partners have something valuable to say to each other. Now, we, t we probably totally take this for granted, and that's why most of you are here. But this is really a new way of thinking about Buddhism, a modern way of thinking about Buddhism. Let's see. Okay. So one side of the conversation is really focused on how Buddhism can help technology, right? And here are several, a few examples. I haven't got time to talk about each one. I don't think you've probably got the mental stamina either to listen to me talk about each one. But they should get, illuminate the category. And if you look at the Buddhist Geeks uh, website, you should be able to, you, you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, that's an example that would fit here, that would fit there. So we've got a real range of phenomena that illustrates the ways Buddhism can talk to technology. Now, from the other side of the conversation, obviously, is the ways that technology can help Buddhism. And this is a real, there's a real range of phenomena here. So there is uh, thinking about how technology can extend classical Buddhist practices, um, like how the internet can, can promote Buddhist uh, Sangha community, the new cyber Sanghas. And then perhaps some more exciting ones are these futuristic imaginings of where technology might take us. Is James Hughes here? So James Hughes, I think, is this your? Was the Buddha helmet your? No, but we okay, you talked about it in your interview, right? And the enlightened machine of, uh, from a transhumanist perspective, envisioning, can we design these technologies that might be able to stimulate and create the neurological correlates of the brain that are the same as Buddhist kind of states of um, enlightenment? Okay. So essentially, these are just categories to kind of organize the phenomena that we find on Buddhist geeks. Having, having organized this phenomena, the next question I asked was, well, how is this conversation affecting Buddhist practice in a wider way? How is the conversation kind of spilling over? And that, le that leads me to the wider effects. One sec. Sorry, I'm terribly nervous. Okay. I'm feeling separation anxiety from my notes. Okay. As, as a good academic should, right? So, so essentially what I, did, what I did was I started to delineate the main themes and patterns arising from the conversation. And I'm just going to give you a few, a few of the main ones. So one of the first things that I found was this conversation with Buddhism and technology is really furthering the uh, democratization of Buddhism. Now, an excellent ex recent example of this was just yesterday with Kenneth Folk's talk. Is Kenneth here? Okay, well, Kenneth opened his talk with the claim that his goal, sorry, with, with, the, with his aim was he wanted to promote enlightenment for, finish me, everyone, everyone, not just for the privileged monks or nuns, now, 
this is essentially a statement of spiritual democracy. It's a statement that's applying the political goal of democracy to a spiritual level. Now, technology is really playing a big role in allowing this to happen or causing this to happen. One example of this is now on the internet, we can have uh, unprecedented direct access to many Buddhist texts and teachings, access without the mediation of a teacher or an institutional affiliation. So it really um, produces a much more uh, egalitarian and kind of participatory model of Buddhist practitioners. The Cyber Sangha is another great example. With the Cyber Sangha, we're seeing the emergence of a peer-to-peer -peer approach alongside, or in some cases, even replacing the traditional hierarchical teacher and student relationship. So these are just a couple of examples of the democratization that's um, arising from the conversation. Um, excuse me. A second example is the emergence of an integrative and world-affirming approach to Buddhism. Now, really, integration is, I think, the buzzword of Buddhist geeks. Buddhist geeks is all about asking the question, thinking together, how can we integrate our meditation practice into all aspects of daily life? Okay, we saw many examples of this yes, yesterday. It seems like a really long time ago, years ago. So Mariana, for example, talked about how can we apply practice, how can we integrate practice to social justice. And Martin talked about how can we integrate meditation with our sexuality and our sexual life. Right. Now, the other thing that's happening with Buddhist Geeks is Buddhist Geeks really has very little interest in renunciation. There are no monastics in this audience. Last year, there was one, I think, out of maybe 260 participants. There was only one re renunciate. Buddhist Geeks is all about developing a practice in the world, a practice that um, really sanctifies the world and affirms the world. Okay. Um, a, a third trend that is happening is the reconfiguration of Buddhist place and space. And um, the, obviously the most obvious here is a shift from the real to the virtual, the did the, I can't remember the other way, the real to the virtual, right? And that's seen primarily in the fact that, look, it's Buddhist geeks, even though they meet once a year, it's primarily an online community. The Buddhist practice and the Buddhist community happens online in virtual space. It's the first time, obviously, in the history of Buddhism that this has happened. Another shift in the reconfiguration of place and space is there is a shift from the privileging of the rural. So if you think about meditation retreats, often you associate them with, uh, you know, I, who's been to IMS on the East Coast here, right? It's, it's out in the countryside, right? It's a, and, and if you think about Buddhist imagery, you think about mountains, yogis practicing in mountains and these kinds of really beautiful areas, natural areas. Buddhist Geeks is really about um, making urban spaces the center of Buddhist practice. Again, Rowan's uh, application, Buddhify, which some of you might know, he, he says, look, the rationale of, describe, of uh, developing Buddhify was because he wants people to be able to practice meditation in urban spaces while they're at the gym, while they're traveling on public transport. Quite unusual in America, I know. Um, <laughs> it's been very difficult for me as a non-driver in the state. Um, and basically walking, right? That you don't have to go on a 10-day retreat in the boonies. You can practice meditation in the city, right? Okay. Now, the final one is both an effect and also a cause of the conversation, and that is the emergence of a new generation of Western Buddhism, the next generation. And this has got quite a lot of press in the kind of Buddhist uh, kind of scenes. So there's this idea that a new generation is emerging, a generation that is equally comfortable and fluent in both Buddhist and technological worlds. And 
a lot of these gener a lot of these Buddhists are from Generation Y and Generation X. But as I'm looking around, I'm seeing that there's not just Generation X and Ys in the room, right? But if you identify with this form of Buddhism, then if you're not from those generations, you can be an honorary, honorary, <laughs> an honorary member. Okay. Because because remember the talk is about from Buddhist hippies to Buddhist geeks, but I was kind of worried because I was seeing a lot of Buddhist hippies here. And I, was, I was like, damn, these people are going to wreck my thesis. Okay. So, in con okay, so having given you a sense, hopefully, of some of the unique features, and I'm sorry it was horribly rushed, um, I want to turn now, though, to thinking about what type of Buddhism, in terms of the historical development of Buddhism, is, is this next generation producing? Okay, so to do this, I'm going to look at two main, I'm going to use two categories of, um, that we use in Buddhist studies to think about different forms of Buddhism. Okay. All right, so the first category is traditional Buddhism, which I don't really need to explain much. Traditional Buddhism is Buddhism as it was uh, developed and practiced in the pre-modern age. It is Buddhism, it's all forms of Asian Buddhism before the encounter with Western modernity. Okay, so it covers all of the three great traditions before they started dialoguing with the West, right? Now clearly, Buddhist geeks does not fall into this category. So that leads us to our next category, okay, of Buddhist modernism. Now, Buddhist modernism is an historically unique form of Buddhism that emerges as a result of the encounter with, of, sorry, pre-modern Asian Buddhism with Western modernity and the, the value system of Western modernity, values like science and democracy. Um, and it starts off in the 19th century. It starts off in the 19th century because in the 19th century, the Asian, uh, Asian Buddhists have to deal with Western, the, the, it's the time of the nation states colonizing Asia. And so there's a dialogue between, for example, Asian Buddhists and Christian missionaries, and Western scientists and enthusiasts and Buddhists. Okay. So in other words, Buddhist modernism, is, it's, not, it's, an, it's a process that's been happening for over 100 years and it starts in Asia it starts in Asia, and it's a dialogue between modernizing Asian Buddhists and Western Buddhists. Now, the go-to book here, which is absolutely superb, is David McMahon's um, Buddhist Modernism. And actually, I think David, did, I think you did an interview with David on Buddhist Geeks, Vince, did you? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, well, you, you have to. He's a fantastic Buddhist scholar. So I really encourage you to, take a, to check this book out. It will give you a really good context of the uh, phenomena of Western Buddhism. Now, just what I want to note from here is modern, Buddhist modernism is a Buddhism that the boomer generation encounter. In other words, in other words they, they already encounter... In other, in other words, they already encounter... A modern a, a Buddhism in most cases it's a little bit different with Tibet because of its geographical isolation um, but, but for the insight the Theravadan Buddhism and Mahayana Zen is already in a process of modernization when the boomers go in the 60s to Asia and start learning Buddhism and what the boomers do is they bring this already modernized form of Buddhism back to the West and then they start to further modernize and uh, develop it. Okay, so in, in many ways, Buddhist geeks, can, does, Buddhist geeks does continue some of the trends of the boomer generation. However, what I propose is Buddhist geeks is best understood as a kind of dialogue with Buddhist modernism, as a kind of response to the limitations of Buddhist modernism. So I want to propose that with I forgot these slides right here. Okay, so what I want to propose that we're seeing is we're seeing a shift with the shift from Buddhist hippies to Buddhist geeks. We're also seeing a shift from Buddhist modernism to Buddhist postmodernism. This is a time to make a gesture of wonder or, or exclamation. <laughs> like, this is a really new thesis. Right. 
Okay, now, before I argue why I want to claim this thesis, which is very convincing and <laughs> awesome thesis, okay, I just want to say a word on postmodernism. So, David Chapman, who is a friend of mine and a conversation partner, who's also written on um, Buddhist modernism of the boomer generation, he warned me not to use the word postmodernism. He said the word postmodernism will really, it will cause an instant mind closure of the audience. His quote is fantastic, so I'm going to read it. For techies, postmodernism, mean, postmodernism means, quote, deliberately obscurantist bullshit <laughs> promulgated by evil English departments <laughs> and Marxist sociology posers who have nothing substantive to say. <laughs> right. I'm totally cool that the best part of my speech is someone else's quote. <laughs> totally cool. I'm down. Okay, but <laughs> from your response, so I just want to invite you to just check in right now, just check in and note if there's any aversion or dullness arising. Right. Okay, gently note it. <laughs> make friends, make friends with it. <laughs> invite it in for a cup of tea, right? <laughs> And then bring your attention back to my thesis, right? <laughs> Buddhist postmodernism, right? <laughs> it's where it's at. <laughs> oh. All right, so now having lulled you into a kind of false sense of relaxation, okay, I'm going to whack you with the PowerPoint slide that you should never present because it's horribly overloaded with information, right? Okay, so. Basically, as the slide excellently illustrates, if we look at the... At, this is really developed more sophisticatedly, that's a word in my uh, article. But if we look at the characteristics, the defining characteristics of postmodernity, we can see that they're illustrated by Buddhist postmodernism. That's where my thesis comes from, right? So I'm going to talk really briefly about each one. Hopefully you already have a sense of these qualities. Um, so the, I think perhaps a major quality of the postmodern is that it really signifies an end or a disillusionment with the grand narratives of modernity. Basically what that means is, is that in the, our postmodern age, we've really lost faith in any one system to bring all the answers to, the hum to human kind of flourishing, right? So postmodernism is seeing as the end of faith in capitalism, in communism, in science. Now, I think the Buddhist geeks really demonstrates this sensibility because if, 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 if Buddhist geeks thought Buddhism had all the answers, for it, there wouldn't be Buddhist geeks, right? There would, be no, there would just be Buddhists. There would be no need for you to dialogue with other fields or other discourses. And also at the opening um, keynote of last year at Buddhist Geeks, I think Vince uh, mentioned this, that we don't, that Buddhist Geeks doesn't believe that Buddhism has all the answers, that any system has all the answers. Now, another way this quality is illuminated is many, there's been a lot, there was a lot of discussion, at least at the last conference, of the value of the label Buddhist. Like, do we really need to call ourselves Buddhists anymore is the value in that. How can we use that label skillfully? Many of you, from, well, at least from the last conference, preferred the signifier hybrid rather than Buddhist. So again, these are just two examples which show this kind of uh, end of the meta-narrative in Buddhism. Hey, a second quality of um, the postmodern is it's an, it's an age of pluralism. It's an age of pluralism because of globalization and also technology in which many different world systems are coming into conversation. Now, the pluralism of Buddhist geeks, obviously it's very pluralistic in terms of the different fields of dialogue. It's also pluralistic in the fact that Buddhist geeks is non-sectarian. By non-sectarian, this means that not one system of Buddhism is privileged here. There are some of you are from the inside community, some of you practice Zen, 
there's some Vajrayana practitioners, okay? Not one is granted a kind of privileged state, which I think is fantastic and really important, okay? Another example of the postmodern, sorry, another quality of the postmodern is pastiche. Pastiche, again, it's a word that often has a, um, people don't like pastiche because it has a, an association of inauthenticity. But in its original meaning, all it meant was the combination of different kind of bits and pieces brought together. And I think this really describes DIY Buddhism, which I'm going to read a quote, so you believe me. The quote's by Rowan, who's been a great resource. Sadly, he's not here. Let's see. Okay, so everyone here is a hacker of the Dharma. We take methodologies, systems, techniques, teachings, and we make them personal to ourselves. We sort of cobble together teachings with bits of string and tape, and we sort of make it all work, and we get results and progress and what we're looking for. That's the experience of hacking. That's the experience of DIY Buddhism. Are you convinced? Yeah? Put your hands up. <laughs> That's what I say to my undergrads. Okay. All right. Now, <laughs> you are much, obviously, more sophisticated. Okay. So, and I <sighs> hope none of my undergrads are listening, by the way, on tricycle. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> okay. So, another quality of the postmodern is that in postmodernity, we find this combination of the traditional and the modern, okay? The goal of modernity, the dream of modernity, was this kind of unfettered progress away from religion towards science. That didn't really work out very well. Of, of course, one of the great failures of that was the, um, the, the atomic uh, bombs. Okay, so this really led to a kind of rethinking, and we see the emergence of a recovery or a return to tradition, as well as this increasing modernization. Now, it's clear that Buddhist geeks are really um, forward thinkers. You're all really pioneers. Um, but Buddhist geeks is not just concerned with innovation. They're really concerned with preservation. A lot of the discussion at the last conference was about how can we balance, how can we keep the jewels of the tradition, how can we preserve the important whilst moving ahead. Um, and we also see this concern with preservation and innovation in the warnings and cautions against Mac mindfulness, right? Or colonizing mindfulness. So again, this is a brilliant example of the modern and the traditional. Okay, now the last quality here is, the, is difference or diversity. And the postmodern is really... From a cultural studies perspective, the postmodern is really a rejection of the universal humanist subject. And it's really an affirmation and a celebration of difference and diversity. And this is what I think, where, this is kind of where I was put in, and I'm really glad that uh, Vince mentioned this in, in his introduction. This is where I was really wanting to put a bit of pressure on Buddhist geeks, because what I found last year was that there was a lot of generational difference. Like a lot of people commented, wow, this is a really unusual Buddhist Sangha because there's people of all ages, there's all different styles represented, many different occupations. I'm really excited that I didn't see many people wearing shawls at this conference because my experience at Buddhist groups was that everyone wore shawls <laughs> and was over like 60 and I was like 18 and really wanted to find a hot Buddhist and was really, <laughs> did not like shawls. Okay, so there is, there really is fashion diversity, it's cool, and <laughs> generational. But what I didn't see in any way last year was uh, racial or ethnic diversity. Buddhist Geeks is a white community, it's a very white community, just like the baby boomers who were kind of like trashing a little bit in the nicest possible way. Okay, <laughs> we are producing the same kind of white centric sanghas, so I was really so happy. Um, to have Kate, to listen to Kate and I knew she was coming. So I want to I want to say to you, if you really want to be unique, you really need to interrogate what why the community is so white and what you can do to make it more inclusive. Um, I really really want you to do that. Okay. So are you all convinced that you're seeing Buddhist postmodernism? Come on. <laughs> all right. So. 
In conclusion, okay, I hope that I've convinced you that you are producing a new form of Buddhism. Now, what I want to say is I chose this slide before I heard Sophie Diaz play the Star Trek movement. I've got witnesses, honest Buddhist witnesses, that I sent this slide in August. So I was kind of a little pissed off that she thought of the music, right? But then I thought, if I thought of the music and she got there first, I'd be really pissed off. Okay. So I thought I'd make the most of it and end on a joke. Okay. So... I hope I haven't overloaded you. I hope you're blown away by the sophistication of my talk. <laughs> and I really mean I'd love to hear from you. Um, and thank you, everyone, for making my job so interesting.